So if we want to make a slow start, I think we can. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. That came up fast. All right. Welcome everyone. Um, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> as people were logging on, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat box um, and say where you're tuning in from and why you're interested in this topic, that would be awesome to have that conversation going on. Um, this is the 27th webinar in our series, Friends from the Field, which we've been doing since April. Um, and it's co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, which is a community conservation organization for Blue Hill and Island Heritage Trust, which is land trust for Deer Isle, Stonington, and the surrounding islands. Um, and we're super excited to have Tom with us. He's, he's our last um, webinar presentation for 2020, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. And we have uh, many more coming up for 2021. So check out our Facebook and website if you would like to register for those. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I'm gonna pass it over to Jake and Tenley for introductions and a little bit of tech help, and then I will um, introduce Tom. Thanks, Lander. So an important feature to point out that we're going to be using um, mostly at the end of the presentation is the chat box. So as Tom is presenting and educating us about brown tail moths, if you have a question, you can certainly ask in the chat box. I think we'll save the questions for the end and Lander and I will go back and forth and kind of pan through. And we'll also have an opportunity to hear from Tenley, the steward director at IHT. Thank you for being here tonight, Tenley. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> The four of us are going to help you figure out what you can do about brown tail moths and give you a little bit of a deeper understanding about, you know, what we can do to help get um, rid of them for the most part. Uh, and then the last feature that we're going to use today tech wise is the raise your hand feature, which you can find in the participants tab if you're tuning in on a laptop. And if you're using a mobile device, I believe if you click more, there should be a little tab that says more dot 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 and the option should be there as well. You can always lower your hand if you click it by mistake or if you change your mind and you don't want to ask your question yourself. But without further ado, I'll hand it back over to Lander and we can do formal introductions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jake. Um, Tenley, did you want to introduce yourself or at all or say any words before I hand it over to Tom? <laughs> well, I'll just say hi. I'm Tenley Orglitz. I'm the stewardship director at Island Heritage Trust and um, I uh, started learning about, about brown tail moths last year um, from Tom and um, he was kind enough to, to help us um, learn about the issue, which is definitely impacting Deer Isle and, and even came out to one of our work days. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear an update and, um, and yeah, just see so many people interested in this issue. Awesome, thanks Tenley. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Tom. Tom Schmelk is a forest entomologist with the Maine Forest Service and the program lead on brown tail moths. And we're absolutely thrilled to have you here, Tom. So I will hand it over to you now. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so for those of you who caught my um, brown tail talk last Valentine's Day, um, promise you there are some updates, but all of the jokes will be exactly the same, <laughs> I promise. All right, we'll share my screen here. Okay, uh, can you all see that pretty good? Okay, cool. So like Lander said, um, I'm uh, one of the forest or forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service, which is under the Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Conservation and Forest. Um, and brown tail moth is um, one of my many programs, but by far it's the, the one that takes up the most time um, and has the biggest impact in Maine. But without further ado, um, Okay, so brown tail moth um, is an invasive moth originally from Europe. Um, it was introduced into the United States in 1897 in Somerville, Massachusetts, um, and it became established in Maine by 1904. Um, and it is uh, in the same family as gypsy moth, which will come into play um, a little bit later in this presentation. Um, so this is roughly the geographic um, native range of brown tail. 
Um, and if you've noticed, uh, a good chunk of the core of the range is roughly at the same latitude that we are here in Maine. Um, so brown tail moth is well adapted um, and well evolved to our climate here um, in Maine. Uh, so it's not a very picky eater at all. Um, has a very wide host range. Um, probably the most common uh, common trees that we see it here in Maine uh, are oak, birch, elm, poplar, cherry, apple, um, and other fruit trees such as pear and quince. Um, but they do occur in other hardwoods. Um, technically, maples are on the host list, but um, I've only ever seen uh, maybe three or four webs in maples, and that's just because there was a, um, a really heavily, heavily infested oaks basically right next to those maple trees. Okay, so there's a lot of fuzzy caterpillars here in Maine. Um, these are some of the most common common caterpillars and how to differentiate them between uh, brown tail moth. So for brown tail moth, it has these two um, hunter orange dots towards the tail end um, and each body segment is um, bordered by these two, by these uh, sort of white marks on the side of each body segment. Um, so Eastern tent caterpillar is another tent making caterpillar um, in Maine. Uh, sort of looks a little similar, um, but Eastern Tent is native um, and has this white line running down uh, its back. And then on the on each body segment, it has these uh, sort of um, peacock eye shaped uh, markings on each body segment. Um, and then for fuzzy caterpillars that don't make tents, um, we have forest tent caterpillar, a little bit of a misnomer. Um, forest tent caterpillar is also native uh, in the same genus as eastern tent, um, and it has these blue lines along the sides of the body and these sort of keyhole marks on each body segment. Um, and then gypsy moth, which is related to brown tail in that same family like I mentioned before, um, and it's these five pairs of blue dots towards the head um, and six pairs of red dots. Um, Gypsy moth is probably one of the most destructive forest pests that we have here in the U.S. Um, it's been here since 1869, and even now the U.S. Forest Service spends uh, about $13 million annually uh, trying to control it. Um, so uh, one other caterpillar that um, people often mistake for brown tail because it does have these two orange dots uh, towards the tail end is white marked tussock moth. Um, white marked tussock, tussock moth is native, um, and but it does cause some irritation to people, although it's never usually found in the numbers that brown tail is. Um, and these irritating hairs are in these little bundles towards the, um, the head end here. But um, just an FYI, brown tail isn't the only one that has these two orange dots, um, but they look quite a bit different. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit uh, about brown tail moth history. Um, so if any of you have seen the winter webs, um, you know they're fairly small, they're about the size of the palm of your hand. Um, so this photo in the upper left is a pile of those uh, winter webs that were clipped out. Um, I'll talk about it uh, in a couple of slides, but there was a bounty paid for brown tail moth uh, winter webs and um, basically, it was five cents for every hundred webs um, these kids would bring in, and kids would go throughout their town and clip um, clip these nests out of their trees and bring them to the um, general store or the town office, and they would be paid a bounty. Um, so you can, if you can imagine um, how many webs are, are in there. Um, I always joke that this is how young Rockefeller made his first million here. Um, but yeah, so, and then the, the other photo here um, on the bottom right is a uh, truck loaded with burlap bags, um, again, full of those winter, uh, brown tail moth winter webs. Um, so there's quite a, an extensive control effort made. 
Um, speaking of which, uh, so winter webs were clipped and burned by the tens of thousands as evidenced by those um, previous photos. Uh, various spray projects were initiated. Um, this chart to the bottom right is a list of some of the things they were spraying around the turn of the century. Um, lime sulfur, arsenate of lead, pyrox, Bordeaux mixture, um, kerosene, tobacco, soap, Bordeaux lead, and something called bug death. Um, so many of these are not available or no longer used as pesticides just because we know uh, that they have a, a really um, prominent environmental impact as well as human health impact. Um, people also, since apple is a preferred host of brown tail, um, people would go through and, and basically whack down their entire orchard and cut all the trees just um, to save themselves some misery from brown tail. Um, this photo of, um, so these are students um, at a farm school that are being taught how to clip out brown tail moth webs um, in addition to their um, yearly pruning of the apple trees. Um, there was also a federal quarantine that was imposed for brown tail. Okay, so um, down here in, uh, in Massachusetts, this is Somerville, Massachusetts, which are, it was um, originally brought or thought to be originally introduced. Um, so the story that I've heard is that it came in on some imported rose bushes. Um, so, so this also another um, side of the story that I've heard is those rose bushes came into a florist shop um, that was happened to be near a railroad depot. Um, and you can see within 17 years, it went from initial introduction to basically taking over most of the Northeast and marching its way um, into Southern Canada. So the maximum uh, extent is 1914, which is this um, lighter shaded gray. Uh, and you can see it was in um, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, um, a little bit down here on the tip of Long Island in New York. Um, half of Connecticut, all of Rhode Island, two thirds of Massachusetts, half of um, Vermont, almost all of New Hampshire, and um, basically uh, half of Maine. Um, one of the reasons why this area probably isn't shaded um, is because that's mostly um, uh, softwood forest. Um, it's all conifers. Brown tail doesn't really um, doesn't like conifers too much. Um, so you see that maximum extent, and then you see this darker shaded area, uh, 1922, um, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides, but um, that was basically after the population collapsed and it slowly started retracting. Okay, so um, when that population was retracting, um, again, this is that maximum extent. Um, in the late teens, early 20s, there was a population collapse. Um, most like, we don't know exactly why that happened. Um, there weren't great records that were taken, um, but it's theorized to have been uh, like uh, weather conditions and also coupled with um, the fungus that attacks brown tail moth, which is called Entomophaga allergy. Um, so those two um, things, in addition to um, bio, a biocontrol program sort of help beat brown tail back. Um, and that population collapse occurred in the, like I said, in the late teens, early 20s. Um, so basically it kept, the population kept getting pushed back until um, in around the, the 19, uh, early 1900, or sorry, the 1970s, uh, it was basically combined to uh, coastal Maine um, and then a couple of spots here on Cape Cod. Um, and there was outbreaks over the, um, the following years, outbreaks and population declines. Um, so this is an excerpt from Babe Gunnell's memoir, A Nice, a nice Life Back Then. Uh, so Babe Gunnell is a woman who grew up in Georgetown, Maine um, on the coast. And she was a, a little girl around the turn of the century when Brown Tail was um, really getting rolling and it was important enough uh, that she decided to write about it in her memoir. 
Um, so I'll let, I'll give everybody a couple minutes to read this. Um, but in it, she talks about the bounty that was paid um, for the brown tail webs. Um, she says, uh, pick 100 and get 5 cents. So, and that's an early, uh, early 1900s money. So pretty profitable for school children. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, so around the time that brown tail moth was um, really becoming a problem in the early 1900s, um, there's a huge biological control program that was initiated. Um, so a lot of parasitoids and predators of brown tail were released, um, but most of them were unfortunately generalists. Um, so remember how I said uh, gypsy moth is uh, related to brown tail. So uh, gypsy moth was introduced intentionally um, in 1869 by a Frenchman who wanted to create an American silk industry um, by breeding gypsy moth with domestic silk moth to um, impart uh, disease uh, resistance for domestic silk moths. Um, we now know that they are not even closely related. They're not even in the same family. So needless to say, his efforts failed. Um, and they escaped his uh, they escaped his cultivation and, and started wreaking havoc um, in the 1870s. So um, like I said, Gypsy moth was probably one of, is probably one of the worst um, worst forest pests that we have in the US. Um, and Basically, there's a, a biocontrol program for gypsy moth. Um, and what they did back in the day is that they would go over to Europe where gypsy moth is native and they would um, collect organisms that were attacking gypsy moth over in Europe and they would bring them back. Um, most of them were um, wasps and flies that uh, would parasitize gypsy moth. Um, so the problem with just going over to Europe and, and bringing back whatever was attacking gypsy moth is that they didn't um, vet these biocontrol agents. They basically, they didn't look to see if they were gonna harm some of our native species. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of these um, flies and wasps they brought over uh, from Europe for gypsy moth, um, they were just generalists. So, in addition to attacking gypsy moth, they also uh, started attacking a lot of our native species, um, like a lot of our native silk moths, like Cecropia and Luna and um, Polyphemus and, and um, that group. So that's happening in the 1870s. Um, fast forward to uh, the early 1900s when brown tails really um, get rolling and building up uh, populations and becoming a nuisance. Um, so a lot of those biocontrol agents, the wasps and flies that were released for gypsy moth in the 1870s um, did make the jump uh, over to brown tail and did start attacking brown tail. Um, remember that gypsy moth and brown tail are in the same family. Um, and there was also a lot of uh, these parasitic flies and wasps that were released specifically for brown tail. Um, unfortunately, again, they did the same thing and went over to Europe, saw it was attacking brown tail and just brought it over. Um, so this fly, Comsolera consonata, um, on the right here, uh, this is the fly that is one of the generalists that was um, brought over. <clears throat> and unfortunately, this, this fly is one of the reasons why we don't have um, very many Cecropia moths anymore. Um, if you have never seen a Cecropia moth, they suggest um, you do a quick Google image, image search. Um, it's, a, it's one of our largest native moths. It sort of looks like a, a Persian carpet. And they used to be a lot more common, um, but because of this fly, Cecropia, and, and many of our other um, silk moths are not as numerous. Okay, so this is a, another just short excerpt from Babe Gunnell's memoir. Um, and in it, she's talking about the population collapse of brown tail that happened um, in the late teens, early 20s. Um, and when she says something seems to, uh, I think something just took them away, she's likely referring to 
um, in part some of these biocontrol agents, but also um, that fungus entomophaga algae that I was talking about. Okay, um, like I said before, um, there weren't super great records uh, taken in the late teens, early 20s, so we don't know the exact cause of the population collapse, um, but combination of weather, the, this fungus, Entomophaga allochi, um, and those fly and wasp parasitoids that were brought over. Okay, so one of the reasons why um, Probably the, the main problem with brown tail is that it is a human health risk and a human health nuisance. Um, if this were gypsy moth, for instance, um, we, nece we wouldn't necessarily uh, be having town by town um, presentations, but unfortunately, this is what um, the, with the reality of living with brown tail is, um, as you can see from this photo, uh, this woman has come into contact with a large quantity of brown tail hairs um, and has a rash all over the back of her neck. Uh, so the problem stems from um, these tiny barbed hairs that are uh, on the caterpillars. Um, so they're barbed and hollow and filled with a toxin. So not only are you getting a uh, chemical irritant with the toxin, but you're also getting the mechanical irritation from the barbs that are on the hair. Um, so these hairs uh, break off the caterpillars um, or um, are attached to shed skins and they can very easily carry in the air and settle on um, grass and, and leaves in your yard. Um, and can, they can become airborne again, especially if it's um, in a sheltered place that doesn't get a whole lot of precipitation, like um, under a deck or an RV, uh, RV or um, boat trailer, stuff like that. Um, where it's nice and dry, those hairs can, can pretty readily become airborne. Um, and the toxin is very stable. Um, it can last between one to three years in the environment. Generally, if it's a uh, more open area, like in the woods, um, something that's getting a, a lot of rain and precipitation, those hairs um, will become incorporated into the soil more readily than, um, again, if it's a sheltered area, like under your deck. Um, so rash can last from hours to weeks. Um, people have talked about it lasting months. That is likely just due to um, coming to contact with the hairs over and over again. Um, not usually likely from one introduction. Um, most common in late in late June and July. Um, that's when the caterpillars are at their largest and most active and wandering around. Um, larger caterpillars have more of those toxic hairs. Um, so as you can see from this photo, um, so each one, each and every single one of these lumps is where one single hair has um, stuck in the skin and sort of released that toxin and um, the barbs on the hairs are, are also causing irritation. Um, so it doesn't take a whole lot of hairs to, to cause a little irritation. Um, so the secondary problem with brown tail is um, it does cause tree damage. So at around 30% defoliation, it will cause uh, some branch dieback in trees. Um, typically, brown tail doesn't kill um, trees on its own. Um, but when you have other stressors, such as uh, the drought that we've had for the past um, two years, this past summer being an especially bad one, um, and other defoliators such as gypsy moth um, and winter moth along the coast, um, you know, those factors combined uh, can lead to, to tree mortality, unfortunately. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna walk you, uh, walk you through how to identify some of the um, most common web building caterpillars um, and how they're diff you can differentiate um, these species from brown tail moth winter webs. Uh, so first up is fall webworm. Um, this is probably the most commonly um, confused for brown tail. It's a very large conspicuous nest um, in some of the same hosts such as apple and cherry and walnut. Um, so these nests are 
are going to be very large. They're going to be about the size of a football, if not larger. Um, that's my hand there for reference. Um, and these are basically occurring in late summer, and the webs will persist um, through the first part of the winter. Um, but again, very, very large nests. Um, brown toe moth is going to be very small. Uh, the webs are going to be about the size of the palm of your hand, if not smaller. Uh, and fall webworm is native. Um, it's one of our, our natives. Um, so eastern ten caterpillar, uh, another very large conspicuous nest. Um, eastern ten is typically more, uh, you see it more in the spring um, and very early summer. Um, brown tail moth winter webs are going to be from uh, basically late fall until the spring. Um, and again, very large nests. They're going to be about the size of a football, if not larger. Um, and typically, uh, these webs are constructed where the branches meet the trunk. Um, and brown tail moth webs are going to be right on the tips of the new vegetation, way out on the branch, never, um, never towards the trunk. And eastern town caterpillar is also native. Um, again, like some of the same hosts that brown tail does, you often see it in cherry and apple. Um, and stuff like that. Okay, uh, brown tail moth. So, like I mentioned before, very small uh, palm sized webs, if not smaller, um, and they're going to be right at the tips of the vegetation, right where the, the new growth is. Um, and they're going to be comprised of a uh, few leaves that are sort of silked over um, and tied together towards the end of the branch tip. And you'll usually see um, some fresh white silk that encompasses the whole um, branch tip. Okay, uh, so we'll jump into the life cycle. Um, we'll start with the stage that they're in now, um, which is their winter web stage. Um, they're dormant in there. Uh, so, um, once we complete the whole life cycle, it'll make a little bit more sense. But um, so the caterpillars are currently sleeping uh, or hibernating in there right now. And um, inside each and every single one of these palm sized webs is between 25 and over 400 caterpillars. Um, so quite a lot. Uh, <clears throat> the webs are pretty variable. Um, so they can be comprised almost completely of silk where you don't really even see too many uh, leaves, um, or they can be something like this oak, oak leaf where it's just a single leaf and it's sort of silt together from the inside. Um, and again, you can see this nice bright white silk down here um, in the bottom right that's attaching the leaf to the um, branch. Um, the all silk and the all leaf are sort of extremes. Um, most commonly, it'll be sort of like this photo um, in the upper left where it's sort of a 50-50 mixture of silk um, and leaves. Uh, so very common site um, throughout most of brown tails range um, in Maine. Uh, also causes uh, some of the biggest problems for management. Uh, so these are very large mature oaks and they're way, uh, the nests are way up at the tippy tops um, of these trees. So one of, the, one of the things you can do in your yard um, right now, um, well, maybe not right this minute, but on the next sunny day, um, walk out into your yard and with the sun, on a nice bright sunny day and with the sun to your back, look up at the tops of your trees. Um, and this photo does a pretty good job of illustrating it, but they'll sort of, the new webs will sort of shine and be bright and whitish and silvery and stand out um, from some of the other leaves that might be just hanging on. Um, that will give you a good idea of where a brown tail moth is in your yard or in your woodlot and it will give you an idea of uh, if you decide to um, treat brown tail in the spring, uh, it'll give you specific trees to focus on. Um, so remember how I mentioned there's between 25 and over 400 caterpillars per web. Um, so this is a very small web that it brought in and this was a couple of years ago. Um, I left it in the lab for about a week um, just to see what would emerge. Um, and each one of these little 
sprinkles here is a uh, brown tail moth caterpillar. And all of these came out of just this one single web. Um, so we'll get into management in a little bit, but um, I just want to reiterate every single web that you clip out um, will be killing that many caterpillars and um, you'll be taking that many caterpillars out of the equation. Okay, um, so fast forward uh, to mid-April um, in the spring and that's when the brown tail moth caterpillars are going to start becoming active again. Um, and typically they'll start becoming active um, when it's in the high 40s, low 50s, pretty reliably, um, when the buds start uh, swelling um, and bursting and, and those ne new leaves come forward. Um, so that's sort of depending on the weather, obviously. Um, typically it's mid-April, uh, but sometimes it's uh, very late April that they'll uh, start to become active. Um, so this photo here on the right uh, is a small brown tail caterpillar that's just emerged from the winter web. You can see how tiny it is. Um, and if the buds haven't broken yet and the leaves aren't out, um, they will come up and mine out the buds so um, and cause some leaf damage that way. Um, but these holes in the buds are, are from this caterpillar. Um, so basically uh, from mid-April, until um, late June, they're going to be feeding on foliage and just uh, growing bigger, shedding their skin each time uh, they grow bigger. Um, and with those shed skins uh, and larger caterpillars come the risk of hairs. Um, so the cast skins have uh, toxic hairs on them, caterpillars have toxic hairs on them, and um, the pupil cocoon, which is on the next slide, um, they all have those. Um, toxic hairs associated with them. Okay, um, in late June, early July, the caterpillars are gonna roam around and start uh, looking for a nice place to pupate. Um, and they can pupate basically in any sheltered area. So under the eaves of your house, um, cars, boat trailers, RVs, um, stuff like that. Um, but then they will also pupate right on the host tree. Um, and there can be, so these leaves that are sort of tied together here on the oak tree, um, there can be multiple caterpillars within each of those, um, those pupil cocoons on the tree. Um, again, so this is the, probably one of the most vulnerable life stages for the caterpillar. Um, and since they're so vulnerable, they, will incorporate um, those toxic hairs into the silk. Um, so just as a, an added deterrent against um, vertebrate predators. Um, so a lot of people see these, uh, you know, lumps of pupil uh, cocoons in their, their trees in your, their yard and they wanna go and clip them. Uh, probably not a great idea. Um, you won't, First, you won't be getting a whole lot of caterpillars with each uh, nest clipped out, um, or not nest, uh, cocoon clipped out, um, but also you're gonna be running the risk of coming into contact with these hairs. Um, I mentioned before, uh, they will pupate on boat trailers and RVs and, and cars. That's also one of the ways that they hitchhike, um, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so, they pupate um, in late June, early July, and then after about a couple weeks, um, the adult moths will come out, which is typically um, mid-July. Um, so this is why they're called brown tail moths. Uh, the adult moths have a brown abdomen with these, um, that's covered in these brown hairs. Um, these hairs are not the toxic hairs that you have to worry about. Um, they don't have any barbs or toxin, um, but they, do go and make more caterpillars um, through their life cycle. Um, one thing that we try to um, try to advise people do um, in that July August time period is that they turn off their outside lights um, between this is ten typically like nine nine thirty um, to midnight is the peak flight time for brown tail moth. Um, 
mostly it's so anecdotal evidence suggests that um, it's mostly males that come to the light, um, but the females are also somewhat attracted to the light. They just tend to hang out on the host foliage just out of reach of the light. So um, people ask me, you know, can we use a, a bug zapper or um, a light trap to trap these moths and kill them? Um, so technically you can, um, but it's sort of just like deer management. Um, if you're only targeting the males, um, unfortunately for us males, we don't really matter too much biologically. Um, if you want to control the population, you have to go after the females because um, it only takes a few males to, to keep the population going and the females are the ones that really um, boost the population. So in order to, and also light traps and um, Bug zappers also kill a lot of the beneficial insects, a lot of the parasitic flies and wasps that attack brown tail, um, as well as many other pest insects. Um, so typically I don't recommend uh, light traps or bug zappers. Um, a lot of people that have tried um, the light trap method have come back to me the previous or in the winter of the following year and tell me that they accidentally boosted the number of uh, brown tail brown tail moths um, in their yard just by looking at the increase in the amount of winter webs in their yard. Um, okay uh, so in mid to late July when when the moths are out and about um, they will mate and then the female will lay the eggs um, directly on the leaves of the host tree um, and each egg mass contains between 200 and 400 eggs. Um, so you can see in this photo, uh, these little tiny baby first instar caterpillars are coming out um, and they'll start grazing, grazing and feeding on the leaf. Um, the egg mass is covered in hairs from the female's abdomen, um, but again, not the toxic hairs you have to worry about. It's sort of just a uh, mechanical protection from um, wasps and flies that are trying to parasitize the um, egg mass. Um, so they are sort of good moms in a sweet, sweet way. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, we also have anecdotal evidence to, to suggest that they, um, they prefer trees that haven't been defoliated um, previously that year. Uh, but in very high populations, they will go right back on the same trees if those trees um, have relieved. Um, so these eggs are going to hatch in August. This photo was taken in August. Um, and so in August, when, when the eggs hatch, um, these small caterpillars will uh, feed communally and they'll sort of graze on the outer surface of the leaf. Um, you can see here the dark green is obviously the uh, with the outer layer on and these caterpillars have sort of grazed that off. Um, so this type of damage is called skeletonization. Um, they don't consume the whole leaf, um, they're just grazing on that outer layer. Um, but when they do that, uh, the leaves will sort of die and turn a, a bronzy, copperish color. Um, and then uh, we fly two rounds of aerial survey each year. Um, and the aerial survey in late summer, early fall um, is to pick up this sort of bronzing uh, skeletonization damage. Oh, and I'll, I forgot to mention, also during this time, they will uh, communally start building that winter web. Um, so this is happening in um, August and September. Um, and by the time um, it gets cold out, they've completed the winter web um, and they're they're in there like they are uh, like they are right now. Um, so this is basically just a summarized version of the life cycle. Um, this is also available on our uh, main forest service website, um, and this is being recorded. So if you need to uh, reference this, you can uh, check back with this presentation or on the website. Um, and the highest risk of exposure for hairs is basically from um, May until July or August, um, and that's when the caterpillars are active and moving around um, and shedding their skin and growing larger. 
Okay, so now a little bit about the current situation of what's going on around uh, the state with brown tail. Um, so in spring of 2019, uh, we did see localized population collapses um, due to the pathogens, uh, mainly that fungus. Um, if you remember in the spring of 2019, we had a really wet May and June, which is perfect conditions for that fungus to uh, grow and proliferate and spread. Um, so that population collapse in spring of 2019 killed most of the cat caterpillars in uh, like the Cumberland, Yarmouth, uh, Freeport area and did give some relief um, to them in, in the spring and summer of 2020. Um, so in 2020, spring and summer, um, this past year, Androscoggin, Kennebec, Knox, and Waldo counties uh, saw the highest populations um, around the state, and that was definitely backed up by the number of calls we received from the, uh, these areas. Um, so this is the aerial survey data. Um, so like I mentioned before, we fly two, two rounds of aerial surveys each year. Um, one is in the late spring, early summer to pick up um, the actual defoliation from the, the mature caterpillars that are consuming the entire leaf. Um, and that's represented by this um, brown color. And then we fly another round of surveys in um, late summer, early fall, um, and that's to pick up that bronzing skeletonization damage um, from the very young caterpillars that have just hatched out. Um, so throughout, uh, so this is obviously throughout the brown tail's uh, currently known range. Um, this table on the side is a breakdown of um, the acres of defoliation per town. Uh, this is also available on our website if you need to refer back to it. Um, so in summary for uh, that previous map, there's 153,000 acres of defoliation, um, which is up quite a bit from uh, our 2018 surveys, which uh, was about 126,000 acres um, of defoliation for that same rough vicinity. Um, we did see increased activity around China Lake. Um, so China Lake and Manchester, or this is China Lake, um, down here in Manchester around Lake Cobbesey, um, we did see an increased uh, level of defoliation. Um, Turner, or, um, <clears throat> in the town of Turner, there's a, um, that population is sort of growing. Um, it was mostly confined to um, an orchard that's so, slowly been uh, spreading since uh, about 2015. Um, so the northern leading edge of the infestation basically stretches from China, China Vassalboro area, um, east of Belfast and a little bit north. Um, for those of you who are, uh, reside in Deer Isle, um, you guys are, are sort of on that leading edge of the infestation. Okay, um, so this is just a, a risk map that we create. So um, we use the data from our aerial surveys, and then we also do an annual winter web um, survey. And in that winter web survey, uh, starting in January, um, our technicians drive the major roads um, throughout the brown tail infested area, and then also um, uh, sort of a buffer around that area just to pick up any expansion or any satellite populations. Um, and then we assign a, a risk category based on the number of, uh, so I forgot to mention during the survey, um, when we're driving the roads, we're dropping data points um, along the roads based on the number of webs um, in the trees that we see as we're going by. Um, and our crews are pretty good at estimating the number of webs um, in each area. So aerial survey data combined with um, the road winter web road survey um, are combined to um, create this risk map. Um, and as you can guys, you guys can see, uh, you guys are high and and moderate, um, which is of no surprise to you, I am sure. And also judging from what I've seen, especially on little little deer Isle. Um, again, this map, uh, so this map was for uh, 2020, 
uh, we have yet to start the um, the winter web survey for this year. Um, it might be a little bit more complicated just due to COVID and having uh, two people per vehicle, but um, we're gonna try our best to get it done. And uh, we have some contingency plans in case that um, doesn't work out. Um, so look for an update. So this map will be updated um, in late March and early April. Uh, so check our website for, for updates on that. Um, so that, Population collapse um, due to the fungus in, in the spring of 2019. Um, these are some of the towns that we did see the fun large fungal outbreaks in. Um, this is a cat. So we had different research and monitoring sites throughout um, Maine. And this is an uh, apple orchard in Turner um, that we've been monitoring for a few years. And this is um, this is basically what caterpillars. Uh, with infected with that fungus Entomophaga allergy look like when they die. They sort of grab on with their um, pro legs in the back here, um, just hang on to the host foliage, and then the, the fungus uh, kills them and then uh, produces spores that sort of rain down um, beneath the caterpillar and infect other caterpillars that are um, uh, in the general vicinity. And the spores can travel uh, pretty far. Um, again, more, uh, more caterpillars that are infected with Entomophaga allergy. Um, they sort of have this yellowy, uh, dusty color, and that's um, some of the spores that are being produced. Um, they also will look a little puffy. Um, these ones are, are ones that have been sort of rained on. Um, they look like little spiky sausages. Um, this was another one of our uh, research and monitoring sites um, at this gentleman's house um, in Whitefield. And when I came, so this gentleman called and uh, said that he had a bunch of fruit trees in his yard and young oak trees, and he didn't know they just dropped their leaves all of a sudden, um, and he didn't know what was going on with them. So I drove out to his house and immediately uh, saw just tons and tons of caterpillars. Um, as you can see, they've uh, completely defoliated, defoliated these trees, leaving just leaf nubs. Um, and there's more caterpillars on these trees than um, there were uh, than there were leaves or leaf nubs. So um, that that year we were expecting a, and this is all happening in 2019. We were expecting a um, an outbreak of the fungus, and we were monitoring each of these different sites um, in order to capture that. So I asked the gentleman if I could um, set up his yard as a monitoring site. And over the next couple of weeks, I'd come back every few days and um, we got a lot of rain luckily. And this is what I saw um, on one of my next visits. Um, all the caterpillars were dead. It was basically 100% mortality. Um, even caterpillars that had crawled off of the trees um, to pupate on the side of the house had sort of died in situ. Um, so it was really, really great news for that area. And I was really hoping um, that this past spring, um, this past May and June, that we were gonna see, uh, we were gonna have more wet and rainy weather, spores would be sort of carried up um, to that leading edge, China Vassal Borough, Belfast. And, um, if it didn't reach you guys up in Deer Isle, um, I had plans to collect caterpillars um, and bring them up to Deer Isle and um, some of the other surrounding areas that are more satellite populations, um, just to introduce the fungus and, and try to get something going up there. Um, but alas, we did not have that weather this past spring. Um, so as many of you remember, um, at least down here in the Augusta area, um, it was really hot and dry in May and June. It was pretty much um, 80s and super dry and dusty. And um, when it's hot and dry, it's, it's not really great, um, great for the fungus and uh, to spread and proliferate. Um, that, so I, I was fully expecting not to see any fungus at all, <clears throat> um, but Again, we set up the monitoring sites and um, we check them out on a weekly basis. And in uh, mid to late June, I did start to see some fungus, uh, fungal outbreaks in Washington, Liberty, and Montville. Um, also, there is one spot in a cemetery in Camden um, that the fungus did pop up, um, but 
<clears throat> again, very small pockets. Uh, um, and they they would have really spread uh, pretty far, uh, I think, if we had the that cool wet weather in May and June. Um, but there is a silver lining. Um, so Washington Liberty and Montville and Camden are um, basically perfectly situated to um, to have an outbreak if we do have that cool wet weather in May and June um, in 2021. Uh, and I'm keeping my fingers and crows. Uh, fingers and toes uh, crossed for that. Um, but yeah, so um, fully wasn't expecting to see it at all, let alone um, sort of on that leading edge. Um, but hopefully uh, we have some more spring-like weather next year. Um, so this is just, uh, this is out actually outside my house. Um, and I was pruning some of the apple trees out in the front yard. And um, this is a uh, caterpillar cadaver from that spring 2019 um, outbreak that we had. So they sort of hang, hang on and um, you can still see the, the effects of the fungus even the following winter um, after that uh, spring and summer outbreak. Um, so going back to that aerial survey that we fly, um, so come uh, late spring, early summer, um, up in that plane, um, flying around and we're flying over the, um, the known brown tail, uh, brown tail infested area. So this was, this was taken um, right outside of Camden. Uh, you can see the Camden Hills in the background. There's a nice fog bank um, over the ocean there. Um, and right around this lake, you can uh, see it more apparently is uh, this sort of light brown area. Those are oak stands that were completely defoliated from brown tail. Um, and this picture doesn't really do it justice. The defoliation sort of goes up into the Camden Hills um, in the distance. Um, and if, if you've spent any time down in the uh, Camden, Lincolnville, Rockport area, um, you, you know exactly what this looks like from the ground. Um, this is that same patch. Um, just a different view. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty devastating. Okay, um, so just some notes on control. Um, so when you're traveling in that infested area, made made of July, um, try not to park under any um, potential hosts. So oak trees, a lot of doctors' offices and uh, shopping centers and supermarkets um, have crab apples or apple trees or um, flower and cherry trees planted. Um, the caterpillars do wander around quite a bit and are very, very good hitchhike hikers. Um, remember, it only took 17 years for brown tail to go from introduction to basically taking over um, all of New England and, and southern Canada there. Um, so don't underestimate the, the hitchhiking capability. Um, and again, it's the caterpillars that hitchhike the cocoons and occasionally the adult moths. Um, <clears throat> so this is this is a couple of years outdated now, but it uh, just illustrates a point. Um, so during that that winter web survey that I was telling you about, all of these little circles are data points that we drop, and you can see that they correspond to a lot of the major roads. Um, obviously, the hotter the dot, the more webs per tree um, there are. Uh, but there's these stars here in Burnham, uh, Bangor, and Eddington. And basically, uh, so those were populations that were sort of away from the main bulk. Um, and it, so they're satellite populations. And they're anecdotally tied to people that have had, um, that have home, vacation homes on the coast. Um, and of course, they're going to go there in May, June, and July, right when the caterpillars are active. Um, and they unknowingly uh, bring brown tail moth um, caterpillars and, and possibly pupa back home with them and accidentally start a, a little spot fire, a little satellite um, infestation. Um, so this is during one of our winter web surveys a couple of years ago. Um, and this is one of those satellite uh, populations way away from the main bulk. Um, so in the circle here, 
um, or three or four winter webs that are sort of um, up in the tops of these trees back here. Uh, one guess of how they got there, and I can tell you that the answer is in this photo. Um, so <laughs> what likely happened is that these folks went, went camping um, on the coast um, during that peak time, May, June, July, and unknowingly picked up some uh, brown tail caterpillars and, and accidentally brought them back home with them um, and started one of these satellite populations. Um, so just something to be aware of. Um, so personal protection um, and some precautions to take with brown tail. Um, June through August, you're obviously gonna wanna um, avoid areas that, are, uh, that have a high infestation of brown tail. Um, obviously you can't do that if that um, area is your own home, um, but definitely try to take as many precautions as you can. Um, one of the important things that a lot of people forget, including me, um, is to, if you live in an area that has a, a high infestation, is to dry your laundry inside. Um, those hairs become airborne pretty easily, um, and you don't want them blowing into um, your shirt or your underwear or your um, bed sheets. Um, it's no fun. They get it from me. Um, okay, so um, you're going to want to take precautions when you're um, doing yard work, so gardening, uh, dragging brush, raking leaves, um, or opening your camp or cottage. Um, it's just, this is probably one of the yard activities are probably the, the most common way people come into contact with the hares, um, just because they, you know, they have a bunch of oak oak trees um, and they're that are loaded with brown tail and they're doing yard work under them um, and continuously coming into contact with those hairs. A um, little funny story for you guys. So um, a couple of years ago, I got a, a call from this um, guy who, who had brown tail moth rash in some of his more sensitive areas. And um, it was the middle of winter and he was asking me how he, he could have come into contact with it. And through talking with him, it sort of came out that um, he had a sauna and <clears throat> he would walk out <laughs> uh, buck naked in the middle of winter, grab some firewood from his stack um, and carry it back um, into the sauna to, to feed the wood stove. And um, so the, what, what likely happened was um, those, that firewood stack was under a tree, an oak tree that had a uh, brown tail moth. Um, a bunch of hairs had settled on the wood. And when he was uh, picking up the wood to bring it inside the sauna, um, he was getting a little close for comfort with the, with the brown tail hairs, unfortunately. Um, but just a little funny anecdote. Um, okay, so just some PPE for you guys. Uh, if you are doing yard work or are working around um, infested areas, uh, coveralls that are uh, taped up at the wrists and ankles, um, respirator and goggles if you are very sensitive, um, head covering, gloves. Um, one thing that our field crews have found that works is pre contact poison ivy wipes. Um, so these are wipes that were designed for um, if you know you're working in an area that has uh, poison ivy, you uh, take out one of these wipes and wipe your skin down. And it basically closes your pores um, to prevent the poison ivy oil from getting um, on your skin and into the pores and making it worse. Um, it works well with brown tail because um, it closes your pores and there's less of a chance of those um, hairs sticking um, into your pores there. Um, so just some tips. Uh, so you're gonna wanna, if you're doing yard work, um, I know it's no fun to, to mow mow the grass or mow the leaves um, when they're wet. But if you <clears throat> have to rake up a, an area, like un, a sheltered area under your deck, wet, wet the area down with a hose first, <clears throat> that'll sort of damp the hairs down and prevent them from becoming airborne and uh, you're breathing them in or them settling on your body. Um, so one of the most common questions that I get is um, in late May and throughout June when the caterpillars are sort of wandering around and they're on people's houses and decks, uh, people ask how they can uh, sort of um, kill them without um, 
you know, breaking out in a rash. So um, if you do have a wet dry vac, um, you can take, uh, fill the bottom with a couple inches of, of soapy water um, and make sure that you have a good HEPA filter um, on your shot vac and you can uh, basically suck them up and the soapy water does two things. It um, kills the caterpillars, but then it also helps those hairs from becoming airborne again and be being blown outside the, being blown back out the vacuum. Um, also the HEPA filter helps with the, the hairs, keeping the hairs inside the vacuum. Um, so just a couple of tips. <clears throat> um, so a couple of notes on management. Um, cold winter temperatures do not kill brown tail, unfortunately. You know, they're way, way up in the tops of those uh, oak trees, blown in the wind all winter. Um, and they're snug as some bugs in a rug um, up there. So what I mentioned before, most of their native range encompasses a lot of the same latitudes that we are here in Maine. And um, aside from uh, topographic anomalies, for a general rule, most of the areas um, are the same latitude, have the same climate. So brown tail moth evolved in Europe. Um, it has pretty much the same climate. So they're already adapted to our coldest winters and our warmest summers. Um, one thing that does kill uh, brown tail, like I mentioned uh, before, is cool wet springs in May and June. Um, and those conditions allow the pathogens that kill brown tail moth to sort of spread and proliferate. Um, the number one being uh, that fungus, Entomophaga allergy, um, but then there are also um, different baculoviruses and other pathogens that attack brown tail moth. Um, Okay, uh, so some winter notes about management. Um, probably one of the most recommended um, forms of treatment is to prune the, the winter webs. Um, again, that's only feasible if they're low, um, not you know in the tops of some of these uh, high oak, oak trees. Even if you were to hire somebody um, to prune, prune out the webs from the very tallest oak trees. Um, it can get expensive fast, um, but focusing on webs you can reach with a pole pruner um, or some snap cuts. Um, remember, every one of those palm-sized webs has between 25 and over 400 caterpillars, so um, really every one, one does count. Um, so some of the benefits of clipping, we uh, clipping webs in the winter, Risk of coming into contact with the hairs is very, very low, if not, um, if not non-existent. Um, you're getting all the caterpillars in one fell swoop because um, they're all inside that web. Um, you can readily see the web since all the leaves are off the trees. Um, so you're not gonna miss any um, in your apple tree. Um, so you're gonna, when you are clipping, you're gonna wanna destroy the webs. Um, don't leave them on the ground because come spring, uh, those caterpillars have a um, real instinct to survive and they know where to, to find their food. They'll crawl right back up on the host tree and um, it'll be sort of like you hadn't done anything. Um, you can destroy the webs either by burning them um, or soaking them in a bucket of soapy water for a few days. Um, the soapy water helps, um, one, break the surface tension of water, but it, um, the silk on the webs is hydrophobic, so it repels water um, and the soap in the water sort of um, helps break break that down a little bit. Um, so if you are pruning, you're going to want to make sure that you prune before mid-April. Um, again, mid-April is when they become active, um, and with that, there's a, a slight increase coming kind of in ooh, into contact with the hairs, um, and uh, you're also might not be getting all the caterpillars because they might be out wandering and um, feeding on the branch. Um, so there is a list of licensed arborists um, that are willing to do brown tail work. Um, there's also a list of licensed pesticide applicators that are willing to do brown tail work. Um, you can find that list on our on the brown tail uh, moth page on the Maine Forest Service website um, or by calling the office. Okay, so a little bit about chemical control. Um, if you do decide to go the chemical control route, you're gonna wanna make sure that you do that um, before the end of May. 
um, later spraying doesn't reduce the risk of hairs because um, if you're spraying in late May or, or in June, um, the caterpillars are large, and even if you do kill all of them, um, there's still going to be a ton of dead caterpillar bodies and their associated hairs in the yard. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you hire a licensed pesticide applicator um, who knows all the rules and regulations that um, board main Board of Pesticide Control um, has put forward, and they're also going to be um, using something uh, that will be effective for brown tail moth and and not just um, your neighbor Joe uh, spraying something out there. Um, the control is more effective if it's widespread. Uh, so if you're, you decide you want to do chemical treatment on, on your property, but your neighbors aren't, um, it will give you some uh, relief around your immediate residence, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not really going to um, be doing too much. Um, so another note on uh, chemicals, um, again, uh, we don't recommend chemicals as the, the first option, um, but it is an option um, that I should mention. Uh, so these bio-rational pesticides, um, these three are the most commonly uh, used for brown tail moth, and bio-rational pesticide um, means that, uh, that these chemicals for these pesticides were derived from a quote unquote naturally um, derived source. Um, so spinosad, which is um, one of the pesticides that a lot of organic farms use, um, is derived from bacterium that's subjected to a very specific fermentation process to develop the active ingredient. Um, it affects the insect nervous system and um, it can be Effect, effective as a contact uh, pesticide, um, as well as being ingested by the, the insect. Um, so uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, kurstaki, um, or BTK, um, as it's shortened to, um, is a bacterium uh, that produces a, a protein that's specific to uh, butterfly and moth larva. So basically, um, it degrades the, the gut lining of caterpillars and um, basically forces them to, or basically uh, forces them to uh, die either from secondary infection or um, not being able to feed. Um, a lot of people ask, um, you know, what about the monarchs and a lot of our native species? <clears throat> That's where one of the, one of the brown tail, uh, one of the aspects of the brown tail moth uh, life cycle is actually plays in our favor. Um, so at the time that you're going to be treating um, with BTK or um, some of these other insecticides, um, that's when brown tail moth caterpillars are are young, and most of our native caterpillars um, overwinter either as eggs um, or say for like monarchs, they haven't even started or they've just started the trip back by the time that you're um, treating for brown tail moth. So that's where that aspect sort of um, plays in your favor. Um, so this last one is Adorectin. Um, I don't think there's too many uh, pesticide applicators that use this in Maine currently, um, but if you guys have ever heard of neem oil, um, this is a chemical that's derived from the seed kernels of that same uh, neem tree. Um, Non-toxic with mammals, um, uh, so on the bottom here, it says uh, it's synergistic with Bavaria. Um, so Bavaria is a genus of fungus, um, and there's different species for um, for many different uh, types of insects. So um, certain species uh, specialize in, say, like grasshoppers or caterpillars. Um, so there's a synergism. So a um, an added effect between azadaractin and that uh, fungus Bavaria. Um, this is the la last slide or second to the last slide. Um, this is just some pros and cons for the different methods. Um, the methods are chemical spray, BT spray, uh, tree injections, or pruning. Um, I'll just give you guys a, a couple minutes to look over this. Okay, 
Okay. And again, this presentation is being recorded. So if you do need to refer back to this, um, just check back with the recorded video. Um, and that's all I have for you. Um, and I'm ready to take any questions you might have. Um, Thank you so much, Tom. That was great. I learned so okay. much. We do have um, a bunch of questions in the chat box. Um, and maybe Tenley and um, Jake and I can just kind of bounce back and forth and find them for you. I'm going to start with the first one that was submitted. Were starlings brought into eat and control the gypsy moth and or the brown tail moth? Um, so I don't think starlings were brought for that specific purpose. Um, the story I've heard with starlings is there is a um, a guy in New York City that wanted to bring all of the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare's plays over um, to the U.S. for some reason, and star European starlings didn't um, gain a foothold. He, the guy actually had to release, try a few different releases for them to become established. Um, but yeah, it's again another um, another guy trying to trying to do something. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. We had a question about the spores and if they're available for anybody, they can use them individually. Like, could they order some and, and spread them on their property? Is that possible? So I, I really, really wish that, uh, <clears throat> that the fungus was commercially available. Um, otherwise, I would totally quit my job and go into the uh, entomophaga alecky business. Um, so <clears throat> I also forgot to mention, so the Fungus for brown tail moth is called Entomophaga alecky. Um, there is another closely related uh, fungus in the, the same genus uh, for gypsy moth that's used actively for gypsy moth control called Entomophaga mimiga. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Entomophaga mimiga doesn't attack brown tail. It's pretty host specific to, um, to gypsy moth. Um, again, since gypsy moth is probably the worst forest pest that we have, um, there's a lot of, and it's it's more than um, just Maine, and it's more than just Maine affected. Um, there's a a large um, large funding source. Be there was a large funding source behind making uh, Entomophaga available or Entomophaga mimiga available for control for gypsy moth. Um, unfortunately, with brown tail, it's basically confined to Maine. There's like a couple spots on Cape Cod, um, but unfortunately, it's mostly a, a main problem. Um, so there's no there's no real impetus for a um, pesticide company uh, to really invest the millions of dollars it would take to uh, weaponize Entomophaga alecky. Um, also, it's sort of been notoriously difficult to culture. Um, in the lab, so that might be another reason why it hasn't been weaponized yet, but unfortunately it isn't available for the public. Um, otherwise, I would be a, a, the biggest proponent for that. Thanks, Tom. Um, it looks like a few of the questions were, were addressed, so I'm going to skip down to one. Um, uh, David Porter asks, is burning a way to detox hairs? Yeah, so from what I've heard, um, high temperatures do, um, do degrade the toxin in the hairs. Um, so for instance, like uh, drying your, your, your clothes um, on high heat uh, in the drying, or in the, yeah, in the dryer will help break down the toxin in those hairs. Um, the barbs in the hairs will, will still be around. You will get some irritation from that, but high heat does um, denature the toxin or the, the proteins and the toxin. Um, but as far as like uh, management on your trees, so I have a lot of people ask me about um, flamethrowers, shotguns, BB guns. <laughs> um, so with flamethrowers, not only are you at risk of lighting forests in your house and your neighbor's house on fire, um, but you're probably causing more damage to the tree um, just by you're toasting the bud. Um, and if you're able to get that close to the web, you might as well just clip it out anyway. Um, 
also a lot of people think that they're these webs are sort of like a bundle of matches right on the, the end of the um, on the end of the branch tip and unfortunately not remember at the time that you're going to be um, the time that you're going to be trying to light these things on fire um, it's going to be in like the 20s or the 30s so you have to <laughs> take that web from the current temperature all the way up to what it's going to combust at and that's basically holding that torch there for quite a long time um, but yeah so so burning the webs um, when you clip them out for sure um, that's a, a good way to get rid of them either uh, in your wood stove although if you're very sensitive I wouldn't suggest bringing them in the house um, but having a burn barrel outside um, perfectly acceptable way and it's I've suggested that it can be a community event, um, especially up in Deer Isle when we do those uh, web clippings. Um, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, somebody's wondering if you could address, um, aside from what you've already covered, any other harms that could come to beneficial caterpillars and pollinators from toxic chemicals? Yeah, definitely. Um, like I said before, the Maine Forest Service does not um, recommend uh, pesticides as the first option. Um, clipping is always the first option. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there are probably innumerable um, effects. We are currently going through a global insect decline, likely, so not only brought on um, by the, the climate, the, the cli things that are going on with the climate right now, um, but also the use of broad spectrum pesticides. Um, even some of these bio-rational pesticides that I've mentioned, um, like spinosa, something that's used on a lot of organic farms, um, that breaks down pretty readily in the environment, um, but it is a, a generalist um, pesticide. It affects insect nervous systems. So um, yeah, it, it's, there's definitely um, negative effects of spraying stuff that's not specific. That's one of the reasons for um, for sort of uh, using uh, BTK is that's specific to um, caterpillars. And again, most of our native cat or most of our native moth and butterflies um, don't overwinter as um, caterpillars. Their uh, eggs or pupa at the time that you're going to be spraying for brown tail. Um, but again, also that uh, fungus Entomophaga allicae, um, I really wish there was a way to, to weaponize that and to get that on a, um, a broad scale because that would be the way to go. Um, Entomophaga allicae does attack other caterpillars, but um, by far it has the biggest punch to brown tail with um, as, few, uh, as few side effects as, as you can think of. Thanks, Tom. I think we have a couple more questions that maybe you haven't already um, addressed in your presentation. One of them was: Have you ever uh, have you ever seen brown tail nests on webs on um, sweet fern? No. So um, <clears throat> brown tail. I mean, it will go into shrubs. It, it likes anything in the rose family. Um, so sweet fern. There are actually I think there's five or six um, native caterpillars or um, typically moth species that do utilize um, sweet fern as a host. Um, I think one of them is the, probably the most common one, I think is called the uh, sweet fern case bearer. Um, and that's usually the, they're making those nests um, sometime during the summer when sweet ferns actively growing. Um, and it's possible that their their webs are still um, tough and, and the silk is still hanging on. Um, but I I don't I've never personally seen uh, brown tail in sweet fern. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, let's see. We have another question about um, BTK. Um, this person's asking if you can use the spray on lake property. Um, Precautions there. I would have to. I'd have to look at the uh, the board of pesticide, um, the updated board of pesticide regulations regarding um, 
because there's different regulations versus uh, so like the zero to 50 foot buffer, uh, 50 to 150 foot buffer, and then 200 foot plus. Um, don't quote me on this, but I do believe that it, it is. Um, you're allowed to use it in that buffer, um, but if you go on the um, main board of pesticide control website, they should have the most updated uh, list on their website for brown tail um, within that buffer. Thanks, Tom. Um, you may have uh, pretty much just covered this question, but there are, there are, there are two more questions in the chat box and I, I know that you've, you've gone over and thank you so much for your time. Um, but I'll just read these questions if you wanna quickly answer them. Um, are there environmental issues, especially on lake water from using the microinfusion injection using tree age, G4, EPA, um, and then there are a bunch of numbers on lake property? Um, so it's, that's sort of a tough question. I know, I know tree injections are um, allowed within that buffer. I can't really speak. Um, I believe triage is acephate, which is one of the more, uh, probably the most common, uh, commonly injected chemical uh, for brown tail. Um, so the reason why that's a tough question um, is because I don't know what the, what the retention in the leaves is. Um, so those leaves, you know, have this insect or uh, pesticide in them and could, um, you know, fall into the water. I don't know if that's really been accurately studied, um, but I, I would think that, um, I would think that the effects of that would probably be negligible, but um, that also being said, um, there's a lot of aquatic insects that um, break down leaves like stoneflies, um, uh, different crane flies and stuff like that. The larvae um, break down leaves in there. They're also insects. So um, yeah, I don't know if, if anybody's done any um, studies on the, the pesticide retention. Um, within those leaves, but it's something to think about. Thanks, Tom. I think I'm scanning through the chat box and I think you've, you've mostly addressed everything. So thank you so much. But one question was um, asked in a couple different ways. The, the webs that are up really, really high on the trees that, you know, our, our normal community members won't get to with a regular safe ladder. Uh, I mean, I guess the obvious answer is that they might have to employ an arborist and get them involved, but are the, is there any other options besides the um, injections that we're not obviously thinking of? Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's probably one of the most difficult um, aspects of pantone management is the fact that they're, they're way up at the tops of the trees. Um, yeah, so, like I mentioned earlier, um, hiring an arborist uh, to prune prune webs out. Like some people have the means to do that, um, but it is a, a very expensive endeavor. Um, but yeah, tree injections. Um, so one thing I, I didn't mention during the presentation um, was that when you go out and you look this winter and, and see where the brown tail webs are, um, you're going to want to focus on the trees that are in high traffic areas, like on your driveway or overhang your deck, your house, um, and not necessarily worry about the trees that are way in the woods. Um, focusing on those high traffic areas will just give you some relief um, from brown tail. But um, so one of the, and I sort of hate saying this, but I have to as my job. Um, so one of the options is tree removal, and we, that's sort of a last resort. It's a permanent solution to a, a temporary problem. Um, but if you were thinking about taking the tree out anyway, or it's diseased, or um, you don't care about it, tree removal is an option. Um, but like I said, it's a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Well, thank you so much, Tom. I think we've come to the end of the questions in the chat box and thank you again so much for um, the extra time that you spent answering all of our questions. Um, yeah, no problem. One, one quick thing I wanted to add um, to let everyone know, you know, who's on here. Um, we do, um, Island Heritage Trust has purchased a bunch of pole pruners, um, including some that are 
allow you to do the clipping by yourself because they're cut and hold pole pruners and they make it much easier. Um, and obviously this will not address the ones that are way up in trees, but for the ones that are, um, uh, you know, in, in medium sized trees, they're, they're really useful and we'd be happy to, um, to loan them out to people who want to either um, work in their own property, um, on a preserve or, or help neighbors. And I, I recognize a bunch of names um, on here of, of people who, who went out and did just that um, last winter. So um, yeah, I wanted to mention that as a resource and um, acknowledge the, the Deer Isle Moss Squad who were pretty amazing last winter. <laughs> That yeah. offer extends to our Blue Hill neighbors as well. Definitely. If wants yes. to venture <laughs> and borrow one for a week or so, you know, just, just get in touch with me or Tenley and we're happy to share. That's what they were purchased for. Thank you, yeah. Tenley. Yeah. And thank, thank you, Tom, for this great, great presentation. Yeah, thank Thanks. you, Tom. Happy to do it. Well, thank well, you all so much. Have a wonderful night. And I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a bunch of the information um, and the recording. Thanks, Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye.